Well, good morning and welcome to New Life Fremont. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here and I'm so glad they've chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you are watching live right now on YouTube, uh, go ahead and jump in the live chat and greet one another, say hello, say good morning. Uh, help us to really see who we are worshiping with this morning. And if you are a newcomer, this is maybe one of your first times joining us for live worship, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're really glad that you're worshiping with us. And uh, at any time, uh, feel free to click on the link in the description to our connection sheet. And that's just a simple way for you to let us know that you were here, that you visited, um, especially if you want to get connected more, tell us about yourself or find out about us. And with that said, let's go ahead and begin our time of worship with our time of calling. Wouldn't it be great if we could just say something and it would happen. Like if I could just say, let the dishes be done and put away. And instantly, you know, food debris would disappear from the dishes and they would all be sparkling clean, neatly stacked in their respective cabinets. That would be great, wouldn't it? Or consider something similar. You know, wouldn't it be great if whatever people said, they did. They followed through. Like when I tell my wife, Holly, I will do the dishes before the night is over. Wouldn't it be great if she could know for sure that because I said I would do the dishes before the night was over, I will do the dishes before the night is over. That actually might not be the best example because of course I always do the dishes before the night is over if I say I will do the dishes before the night is over. Do not ask Holly about it, just trust me. But my point remains. It would be great if when people said they would do something, they did that thing. But we know that neither of these things are the case. Obviously I cannot make things happen just by saying them. You know, I can't make the dishes clean just by saying, let the dishes be clean. And unfortunately, there are times when people, when we say we will do things and then we don't do them. And that's because these are two separate things, saying something and doing something. They're not the same thing. But did you know that for God, they are the same thing for God? To say something is to do something. When he says, let there be light, there is light. When he says that he will do something, he does that thing. For God, saying and doing are essentially the same thing. They can't be separated. They are infinitely intertwined. What God says is what's done. And that's just one of the reasons why we gather together as his people each week to worship him. And so I invite you to hear and respond to this call to worship from Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Blessed Lord, you caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us the disposition to hear them, to read, to mark, to learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
continue worship now with our time of cleansing. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 21. There's a father and he has two sons and he goes to the first son and he asks him to work in the vineyard that day. But the first first son says he will not go work in the vineyard. But then a little bit later, he changes his mind and he does go to work in the vineyard. And the father also goes to his second son and asks him to go work in the vineyard that day. And the second son says that he will go work in the vineyard. But then a little bit later, he changes his mind and he does not go to work in the vineyard. So Jesus ends the parable by asking the crowd a question. He asks them, which of the two sons did the will of his father? And the crowd answers the first son, which is obviously correct. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day said with their lips that they loved God, that they wanted to obey him, that they would do the Father's will, but then they didn't do the Father's will. And so Jesus points out what we all already know, saying that you will do what the Father's will is, is not the same as doing the Father's will. And you see, we make a similar mistake in our 21st century Western evangelical reformed cultural context. We are tempted to think that our obedience simply amounts to knowing what God's word says. We're tempted to believe that all God calls us to is right beliefs. As long as we know what God says, we're good. But Jesus says that the standard is higher than that. We can't just tell the Father we know what he wants. We're called to actually do what he wants. And so here now the law of God, which comes from James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. Almighty God and eternal Father, we acknowledge and confess to you that we were born in unrighteousness. Our life is full of sin and transgression. We have not gladly believed your word nor followed your holy commandments. For your goodness sake and for your name's sake, be gracious to us, we pray, and forgive us all our sin which is very great. Amen. Please use this time for silent confession of sin. Father in heaven, you freely forgive all who confess their sins and repent. And we admit, Lord, that we are often hearers of your word only. We deceive ourselves into thinking that knowing what your word says is the same as doing what your word says. We leave so much of what you have commanded undone. But you ask us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. Forgive us, Lord, change our hearts, empower us to move beyond just the knowledge of your word to people who do what your word says. Have mercy on us and cleanse us, we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now the reading of the gospel, which comes from Acts chapter 10, verse 43. To Jesus of Nazareth, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. 
If you have believed in Jesus, the the missing third son in the parable, who tells the father, your will be done, and then does it. If you have believed in Jesus, confessed your sins, and turned away from them, then you can be sure that your sins are forgiven. Amen. Welcome to New Life Mission Church of Fremont. I'm Gabriel. At the piano here is my son, Elliot. And behind the camera is my daughter, Madeline. And at the desk of Make Believe is my wife, Bonnie. If you're new here, a special welcome to you. Please fill out the connection sheet that's linked in the description of this video. And now, let's head on over to the desk of Make Believe. Looks like King Sunday the 13th is in his royal palace. Oh, welcome. Welcome. I am so tired of sheltering in my castle. I wonder, are there any new announcements for the kingdom today or this month? Why, yes. If you're tired of sheltering in your palace, then it's time to get out to the New Life Cycling Night tonight at 6 p.m. Meet at the Beard Staging Area on the paved side of the Alameda Creek Regional Trail in Fremont. Oh, that sounds like fun. How long will this bike ride be? Well, it's about 10 to 12 miles. Oh, ho, ho. will there be a break? Uh, yes, yes, there should be at least one short break. And uh, if you are going to go, please make sure you wear your face covering and a helmet. Oh. I, being the king I am, may pass on this one. What else is going on this month? Well, next week, Sunday, the 20th of September, the youth group is going to be starting their online Zoom meetings at 4 p.m. Oh, youth group. I wonder, can I go to youth group? Well, anyone who's in middle school or high school can join the youth group. Well, Daniel, that may be a very good opportunity for you. Yes, I think I might join. Well, uh, also this month, no, nothing else this month. Next month, <laughs> October the 7th on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., there'll be a special event called Theology on Tap. What is Theology on Tap, Gabriel? It is a special event. Ask Pastor Kevin or Pastor Dave your hard or easy or not so hard or easy questions. The special subject for the night will be Christianity and politics. Oh, oh, oh. You don't even have to vote for me. I am king automatically. <laughs> What's the last announcement? Um, let's see here. Ah, if you want to stay in touch, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button on this video. And to keep uh, informed of what's going on in our church, please do subscribe to our church newsletter at newlifefremont.org, which is linked in the description of this video. And now, let's get back to Pastor Dave. Good morning. Welcome to New Life Fremont. Uh, my name is Dave, and it's so good to be worshiping with you again. Halls, thank you so much for that amazing announcement. It's always so good to see faces from our church family, and I'm sure you guys are tired of seeing my face and Kevin's face 
And so uh, again, if you are interested in making announcements for our church, please let Pastor Kevin know, and we'd love to get more of you uh, up here uh, giving announcements on our online worship services. We are continuing our sermon series called Living in Crisis. In fact, we are concluding the sermon series today. And uh, this series, Living in Crisis, is our 2020 take on Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us how to live in the kingdom of God, uh, how, how faith in the gospel should shape and transform our lives. And it's been such a timely word for us as we navigate all the obstacles, all the struggles, all the dangers of this historic moment of pandemic and wildfires and political upheaval and division and an election year, all this stuff that we're dealing with. So today we come to the conclusion and Jesus ends his sermon with a bang. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 29. This is the reading of God's word. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Can you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see wonderful things in your word, to, to encounter you in your word. So Holy Spirit, uh, take the blinders off our eyes, soften our hearts, and uh, engage with us in all the places, Lord, where we are struggling, feeling distracted, where we're doubting and questioning, Lord, we pray that you would meet us in a powerful way, that we'd hear your voice, and that you would fill us with hope and purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stephen Covey, who was a really well-known writer uh, who wrote books for business management, uh, once wrote that if a ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. Uh, can you imagine climbing a huge house, uh, a huge ladder uh, up, up to the roof on a house, spending the entire day fixing the roof only to discover at the end of the day that it was 
leaning on the wrong house, and that you were fixing the wrong roof, and that you'd have to do it all over again the next day. Um, you can be a skilled climber, you could be skilled at fixing a roof, but if your ladder is leaning against the wrong wall, nothing you do will matter. And so if you think of the Sermon on the Mount as a ladder, one big ladder that Jesus is calling us to climb, the wall we need to lean it against is heaven. And so this is how Jesus concludes this sermon by pointing us to heaven. And we tend to think of heaven as a destination that we have to wait for. We just have to endure as long as we can, as hard as we can until we get there. But Jesus is showing us at the end of his sermon that heaven is way more than just a destination. Heaven gives us purpose. It, heaven gives, us, gives purpose to everything that we do here and now. The reality of heaven guarantees that we are not just going to the wrong place faster. If our ladder is leaning against heaven, we can know that no matter how hard the climb is, no matter how long it takes us to get there, that our work will not be in vain. So Jesus concludes his masterful Sermon on the Mount by showing us how to lean our ladder against heaven. And he'll show us how to do this in three different ways. First, he's going to show us that we can't be fooled into taking the wrong way to heaven. And number two, he's going to show us that we can't be aimless about entering heaven. And number three, he's going to show us how we can't try to get ahead of Jesus on the way to heaven. So let's start with the first point. Don't be fooled into taking the wrong way to heaven. Jesus ends his Sermon on the Mount with four metaphors about the wrong way to heaven. He wants us to know that there are many ways to go wrong when you're seeking heaven, many ways to go wrong when you respond to the sermon. Uh, we can think that we're headed for heaven when we're actually headed for destruction. Uh, we've been fooled to take the wrong roads, to follow the wrong prophets, to serve the wrong lords, and to build on the wrong foundations. And so Jesus wants us to enter into heaven. And so he warns us not to be fooled. The first metaphor is the metaphor of a wide gate and a wide road. Jesus wants us to know that the way to destruction is deceptively popular and easy. Many people will go through the wide gate and walk down the wide road. The wide gate and the wide road are obvious. Tim Keller talks about how everyone respects spiritual seekers this day. If you tell people, I'm searching for the truth, I'm searching for God, uh, people will respect that. But if you say, I have found God, I have found the truth, people will feel really uncomfortable around you. We're not afraid to say that we're searching for God. We're afraid to say that we've found God. We're not afraid to say that we're searching for the truth, but we are uncomfortable saying that we've found the truth. We're afraid to say that anyone else could be wrong in their beliefs about God. And this is tragic because we're always seeking but never finding. We're so afraid of saying that some beliefs are wrong that we can't truly believe anything that is right. Uh, a road filled with seekers who never find what they're looking for seems so much wider, so much easier, so much more inclusive. But the problem is that it leads nowhere. It leads to destruction. A road where God can be found is going to be more narrow. It's going to be harder to travel. The wide road is easier, but it leads to destruction. The second metaphor that Jesus gives us is this metaphor of a fruitless tree. In verse 16, Jesus says, you will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes 
gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Uh, Jesus is describing a Middle Eastern plant called a buckthorn. And a buckthorn produced these thistles that from a distance look like grapes. But if you look closely, it's really clear that these are not fruit. They are not edible. They're actually thorns and thistles. Jesus says that false prophets are like fruitless thorn bushes. Now notice, he, he doesn't describe these false prophets the way that we might. Um, when I think of false prophet, I think about someone who teaches heresy, someone who holds to wrong doctrine. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says what makes them false is their character, the fact that they are fruitless. These prophets may be charismatic speakers. They may even be orthodox in their theology and their doctrine. They may have warm, engaging personalities. They may know the Bible really well. They may lead successful ministries, but they have no spiritual fruit in their lives. They're not driven by love. They have no gentleness. They, they lack humility. They have no true joy or peace in their lives. They burn through relationships. When their ministry is going well, they act like sweet sheep. But when things get tough, they act like wolves. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. The third metaphor that Jesus gives us is about a hardworking servant. Jesus says that people will come to him in heaven saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? But he will reply, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, Jesus isn't saying that he's not going to know who these people are. He won't know their names. He's saying that he's never had a relationship with them. They call him Lord, but they didn't treat him like a Lord. And so he never was their Lord. They were actually not serving Jesus. They, they said they were doing these things for Jesus in his name, but they were actually doing it for a different Lord, a different master. Now, it's easy for us to assume that the hardest working people at a church or at a nonprofit people who are working hard to help others, that these are the people who are closest to God. But that's not always true. Uh, like a husband who speaks, spends every waking hour at work saying that he's doing it all for his family, but hardly knows his wife and children. We can say that we're working hard for God when we're actually doing it for ourselves. The last metaphor that Jesus gives us is about a house built on a bad foundation. When the weather is nice, a house built on sand looks as sturdy as a house built on a rock foundation. But when the flash floods come, as they often did in the ancient Near East, the house built on sand will be swept away. Jesus is saying that the most spiritually empty people can actually look like they're doing really well when things are going their way. But when the storms of life come, they will start falling apart. In one way or another, we're all experiencing this right now. The pandemic, the financial downturn, the wildfires, the social unrest, uh, all the chaos that we're going through. It's, it's exposing the weaknesses that all of us have in our foundations. Now, Jesus wants us to know that if we do nothing, if we just go with the flow, we're all going to be fooled. We are going to end up on the wide and easy road. We're going to end up following false prophets. We're going to end up uh, doing a lot maybe doing too much in Jesus's name or doing nothing in Jesus's name. Uh, we're going to build our entire lives on sandy ground. What he's saying is that we can't be aimless about our faith. This brings us to our second point. Don't be aimless about entering heaven.
If you've ever been in a hall of mirrors at a carnival, you know that the key is to not trust your eyes. Uh, some of the mirrors are curved to distort the way that your surroundings appear. You don't want to walk through a hall of mirrors aimlessly. In fact, the whole point of going into a hall of mirrors, the fun of being in a hall of mirrors, is figuring out how the house is set up to fool you. The way to heaven is like a hall of mirrors. There are so many ways to be fooled about what heaven is and how we get there. We need to search for the narrow gate to find it. We need to look for spiritual fruit in order to know which prophets are true. We need to focus on our relationship with Jesus more than we focus on the things that we do for Jesus in order to know that he is our Lord. We need to build our lives on God's word, not on good weather, if we want to have something in our lives that endures. So in verse 14, Jesus says, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. That means that following Jesus is going to often be unpopular. It will go against some of the most accepted ideas of our society. If you are looking for the narrow gate and you're looking for the, 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 the things that might fool you away from the narrow gate, you're going to look weird. One of the weirdest things about people who are determined to go through the narrow gate is that they seek fruit more than success. Their role models are not necessarily the most successful people in the world. Their role models are the most godly people in the world. They love spending time with people who exude the fruit of the Spirit. They can't resist rubbing elbows with people who are growing in grace. They know how to recognize wolves in sheep's clothing because they don't value anything that the wolf values. There's a scene in the book, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, and this is a fictional story of a field trip uh, of, uh, from hell to heaven. And so a group of deceived people are, are visiting heaven. And at one point, one of these people on the field trip, an artist has a conversation with an angel. And the artist is eager to meet his heroes. He asks the angel if there was any chance he could meet Claude or Cezanne or someone else who was distinguished. The angel replies, but they aren't distinguished, no more than anyone else. Don't you understand? The glory flows into everyone and back from everyone. The dumbfounded artist asks, do you mean there are no famous men? The angel says, they are all famous. They are all known, remembered, recognized by the only mind that can give a perfect judgment. When you are seeking the narrow gate and the narrow way, you become less and less impressed with fame and glory and brilliance and success and beauty and creativity. You become more impressed with how a person believes that they are completely loved by God. You want to know people whose lives have been transformed by God's grace, people who are exuding the light of Christ in their lives. A person who wants to grow in grace more than anything else will never say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? That's what the person is saying in verse 22 in Jesus's next metaphor. Uh, this person calls Jesus Lord. He calls him Lord twice, which is the Hebrew way of really emphasizing something. They're, they're saying, Jesus, you are the Lord, the great Lord, Lord, Lord. But when you listen to what they say, they don't really treat Jesus like a Lord, Lord, because they don't say anything else about Jesus. Notice what follows is a long description, not of Jesus's greatness, but their own greatness. Here they are standing in the presence of the Lord of all creation, and all they can do is talk about themselves. At another point, 
the artist in The Great Divorce asks the angel how soon he could start painting. The angel bursts into laughter and says, don't you see you'll never paint at all if that's what you're thinking about? The artist protests that, that you can't stop a painter from painting in heaven. And the angel responds, every poet and musician an artist, but for grace, is drawn away from the love of the thing he tells to the love of the telling, till down in deep hell they cannot be interested in God at all, but only in what they say about him. For it doesn't stop at being interested in pain, you know. They sink lower, becoming interested in their own personalities and then in nothing but their own reputations. People who are seeking the narrow gate and the narrow way learn to talk about Jesus a lot more than they talk about themselves. They care more about the muse of their art than their art. They don't fret over how much they're doing. They don't worry if their work is in vain. They don't feel the need to, 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 to hear what people think think about them or their work. They don't feel the need to let God or anyone else know how much they've accomplished. They're too caught up in who Jesus is. They're too caught up in his perfection, his holiness, his glory, and his loving kindness. They're utterly humbled and completely content to simply know and be known by Jesus. When you learn to value your relationship with Jesus more than the, the way that you value the things that you do for Jesus, you will realize that you need to build your life on God's word, not on good weather. When the artist in The Great Divorce realizes that his art is not valued in heaven in the same way it was valued on earth, he says, I guess one must be content with one's reputation. And the angel starts laughing again, and he tells the artist that he's already been forgotten on earth. There was a time when the sun was shining on this artist's career, but like a flash flood rushing through a home built on sand, all his work was swept away in the shifting fashions and tastes of the world. See, people who are seeking the narrow gate and the narrow way to learn to build their lives on God's word, not on good weather. They learn to hold loosely to the things of this world, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They don't put their hope in the things of this world, and they don't become hopeless. They don't lose hope when they lose the things of this world. They believe that God loves them, and his promises are trustworthy, and they build their lives on God's unchanging word. See, it takes time and effort and intentionality to see the way to heaven. If we're not seeking the narrow way to heaven, the default will be folly. To aim at heaven, you need to learn to see what most other people don't see. You need to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. And this isn't easy. This brings us to our last point. Don't try to get ahead of Jesus on your way to heaven. When Jesus finished his sermon, verses 28 and 29 tell us that the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Jesus didn't teach like a scribe or a pastor. He preached with authority. Jesus says that he will be the one to judge whether or not people are able to enter heaven. He says that we need to obey his word if we want to enter heaven. And so, that original audience, that crowd of people that were listening to his sermon were astonished. Can you remember the last time you were astonished by someone's authority? Uh, when I was in seminary, a church history professor told us on the first day of class that we were required uh, to uh, read close to 2,000 pages of dense books and excerpts from the Middle Ages and the Protestant Reformation. And this required reading would account for 30% of our grade. And I was astonished. 
I, I was genuinely afraid that I was going to fail his class. Maybe you're feeling astonished with today's passage this morning. Uh, maybe you can't help scratching your head over the audacity of Jesus' claim to exclusive truth, that he is God, that he is the narrow way. Maybe you're wondering if you have any chance of meeting Jesus' impossibly high spiritual standards, which he's laid out not only in this passage, but in the entire Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you're wondering if Jesus will tell you, I never knew you. Well, we need to remember not to get ahead of Jesus on our way to heaven. Jesus isn't telling us to find our own way into heaven. He's telling us to follow him into heaven. Look at verse 24. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus is telling us to follow him, follow his words, because he has, is going before us, not only to make a way into heaven, but to make a way through God's judgment. When you get caught in a wildfire, there's only one safe way of escape. And it's not downwind, because the wind can change at any moment. If you want to find safety when you're getting boxed in in a wildfire, the, the safest way is through burned ground, scorched earth. Uh, when you walk on land that's already been burned, you're going to be safe. And, and here, we need to keep in mind that Jesus is inviting us into heaven by going before us. And when he died on the cross, he absorbed the Father's wrath. He, does, he absorbed God's judgment, the fire of God's judgment. Jesus became the scorched earth that we walk upon to enter heaven safely. And if we enter heaven, it's not a result of our effort. It's not because we were so perfect or so good because we got it so right. It's because we heard Jesus' word and we put our faith in his word and we acted on his word and we followed him into heaven no matter how hard life got for us here and now. When Jesus tells you to go through the narrow gate, and to walk through the narrow road. He's telling you to go through him. He is the only safe way into heaven. So you don't need to be afraid of Jesus. You know what this means? This means that no one is beyond redemption. Even wolves in sheep's clothing can be redeemed. The famous uh, theologian Abraham Kuyper actually became a Christian years after he became a pastor. Uh, one day, an old woman at his church suspected that Kuiper didn't really believe in Jesus, so she shared the gospel with him, and he put his faith in Jesus, and it changed his life. A pastor recently told me that after years of trying and failing, he recently started having regular times of devotion in God's word. And he concluded, blessed is the man who never starts, but Blessed is the man who never stops starting. It's a tongue, tongue twister. Uh, sometimes we get frustrated with ourselves, don't we? Because we find that we have to start all over again, over and over again. We, we try to have regular times of prayer, and then we drop the ball, and we get away from it, and we have to start over. And, and it, it, eventually we get tired of starting over. We wonder if it's worth the effort at all. Jesus sets us free from the shame of starting over. He shows us that it is a blessing to always start over and over again. In fact, the entire Christian life is really one long series of starting over and over and over again. Fruitfulness in the kingdom of God is not about perfection. It's not about getting the fruit of the Spirit perfect. It's about direction. Are you aiming for Jesus in your life? Are you aiming for heaven in your life? Have you leaned your ladder on heaven? Is that your hope? Are you putting your hope over the scorched earth that Jesus became for you? If you are, 
then the shame of failure will be wiped away and you will be free to start over and over again. Blessed are you if you never stop starting. So what are some of the things that you need to start doing to apply the gospel of Jesus into your life? I want to encourage you to read over the Sermon on the Mount in one sitting. Reflect on some of the things that God's taught you in this series and ask him for the grace to start over and over again because he loves you. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you don't call us to perfection, but you point us in the safe direction. And there is no safety for us in this world except Jesus. That is so clear to us right now as so many of the things that we put our hope in uh, are being taken away from us. And so, Lord, we thank you for this challenging word, this challenging sermon. Uh, and God, we thank you most of all for Jesus, who makes sense of it and delivers it, it not, not only in a way that confronts the areas of our lives where we need to be confronted, but with the grace that redeems us in the parts of our lives where we might feel most irredeemable. And so, God, whether it's for the first time or just one more time, we pray that you would call us to start over again, Lord, to seek your face, to, to, to go one step up that ladder, to lean it on Jesus, to aim for heaven, and Lord, to build a stronger foundation for our lives, to bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, Lord, to boast in Jesus and not in ourselves and to be unafraid to walk the narrow way. We ask all this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing our final song, I do want to note that this is the time of the service where we would normally collect our tithes and offerings. And even though we're worshiping physically apart, you can still give to the ministry of this church through our website, newlifefremont.org clicking on the Give tab, which will give you an electronic option, as well as our mailing address if you wanted to mail a check. But with that said, let's continue with worship and sing our final song together.
As always, the final words of our worship service are the Lord's blessing to you. Our benediction comes from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. So stretch out your hands and receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. We will see you next week.